scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah from chapter 52 verses 13 up until chapter 53 verse 12 and you can find this on pages 9 and 10 of the bulletin Behold my servant shall act wisely he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted as many were astonished at you his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind so shall he sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by god and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth yet it was the will of the lord to crush him he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days the will of the lord shall prosper in his hand out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities therefore i will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgression transgressors this is god's word we're in a series in isaiah and uh, we're in a beautiful passage in isaiah and uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah this 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 morning sermon i want to ask the question uh, or, or title the sermon can this really be what god is like uh, can this really be what god is like in uh, 1804 the story is told of thomas jefferson Uh, who was a rationalist and who didn't believe in anything that couldn't be explained by natural means and he started to uh, read the bible and he with a pair of scissors uh, and he started to cut out all the parts of the bible that had anything miraculous about it so any well, jesus walking on water calming the storm all this stuff he just cut it out uh, and most people might have uh, that view of the bible in the modern world that these miracles you know we don't really Uh, believe and if you were to take a pair of scissors you might cut out all of these same things but there's one miracle that you might miss out on that god justifies the ungodly god justifies the ungodly which means he takes people who are nothing like him and through a mysterious miracle he transforms them into people who are exactly like him who have his righteousness and this is a miracle and the the passage we have before us uh, tells us uh, how this miracle happens and who is going to make this happen 
uh, it's uh, it, and this this passage is uh, <clears throat> it was a mystery uh, to Israel because this, it describes this person who is victorious, which is what ancient Israel wants, some victor to relieve them from their captivity. But this servant is also suffering, which is what they don't want. So it's a mystery. Who is this person? Uh, but for us in the 21st century, this is history, right? We, we know from as early as Acts, uh, where a man named Philip meets a eunuch and looks at this passage and points to it and says, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. So we know that. So one scholar uh, says this, is, this passage has been written as if it was written by someone who's taking notes at the foot of the cross, watching what's happening and recording it. But the shocking thing is this was written 700 years before the death of Christ. Seven centuries before, describing as accurately as possible what is happening on the cross. It's so important in the Bible that this has been called the Mount Everest of the Old Testament. It's a very difficult thing to climb, but once you get to the top, the view is matchless. It's an extraordinary uh, view. It's been called the jewel and the crown of Isaiah's theology, like the Kohinu diamond and the jewel of the crown. It's just this precious thing. It is the focal point of Isaiah's uh, theology. As uh, Spurgeon said, it is the Bible in miniature. It is the gospel in its essence. Such is this passage. And one scholar says, without any exaggeration, it is the most important text of the Old Testament. It is the most important text of the Old Testament. Uh, if this passage was a building, if you took this passage and you took its words and you turned them into a building that was made of bricks, it would be an architectural wonder. It would be like this, this room where you go, uh, this, this building that you go in and there's all kinds of hidden uh, passages and uh, passageways and, and hidden treasures in it. But the fundamental structure of the building would be like this. There would be an outer room, there would be an inner room, and there would be a central chamber in which there's a hidden treasure. That's the way this passage is structured. That's how Hebrews, uh, the, the Jewish people wrote their Hebrew poetry. So it has, so if you look at your notes, you'll see there's an oddity in the way that we work through this passage. We're going to work from the beginning and the end, because that's the outer chamber. They have a shared theme. And then you have the inner chamber. We're going to work at the next, uh, the second passage from the beginning and the second passage from the end. That's the inner chamber. That has a, a unifying theme. But at the heart of it is verses 4 and 6, which tells you the central chamber and the hidden treasure uh, in this passage. Uh, so we're going to ask the question today, uh, why is it unnatural to believe that Jesus is the only way to be united to God? And what would happen if we believed it? Why is it unnatural uh, to believe Jesus is the only way to be united to God? And what would happen if we believed it? Uh, first of all, his first impression. Uh, second, his great suffering. And third, his audacious uh, proposal. Uh, so first of all, his first impression. <clears throat> uh, if you look at verse 52, uh, chapter 52, verse 13 onwards. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Uh, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Uh, so far, so good. Verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. And then at the end of this passage, chapter 53, verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, this will tell us two things about Jesus that are very unnatural to accept. Uh, the first is that he's rejected. He's rejected, but he's redemptive. And the second is that he's crushed, but he's victorious. So let's look at the first. He, if you look at his appearance, uh, if, you expect, if, you, if you hear that God is arriving, you expect him to be appealing. You don't expect him to be appalling. 
you don't expect god to be lo- to look disgusting and that's what this passage is saying his appearance is was so marred beyond human semblance that of, and beyond that of the children of mankind he in a way in a manner of saying it's saying he is so despicable even his mother would not recognize him that's how marred his physical appearance he doesn't even look like a human being and you have to ask why is this because it's it's pointing to the crucifixion the crucifixion is an ugly thing the romans had mastered the art not just of killing someone but humiliating them and bringing them to such violent ends that you look at you 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 are told to look at the cross but the moment you look at it, you want to look away like those uh, cigarette packets that have the face of somebody with a tumor sticking out it's designed to be disgusting they want you to look at it and look away at the same time it's like a dalit person hung from a tree because a shadow fell on high caste property and an example has to be set that's what it is and the 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 question it provokes is is not just is this the servant of the lord but the question is is this even a human being he cannot save himself how can he save me you don't expect god to be appalling you expect him uh, you don't expect him to be uh, appalling expect him to be appealing everyone wants a victorious god no one wants a crucified one and so shocking is this that the kings of the nation uh, will say we have never seen anything like this we never heard anything like this this is shocking so shocking so that's the first reason we do, why we don't believe it his he, his appearance he looks appalling but he's not appealing but the second uh he's crushed but he's victorious but he's crushed but he's victorious but his the his the way he works is according to his time not ours look at how much future tense there is here the word shall appears about uh 13 times it's future shall he shall he shall he shall he shall he shall 13 times in this section because the pattern of how god reveals himself is this uh, the pattern is first an announcement is made something is going to happen and after that the action is taken the thing that something that god said would happen happens and then the explanation is given this is what it means this is the pattern of divine announcement it always works like this i'll tell you what i'm going to do then i'll do it then i'll explain it we don't work like that we want okay jesus savior of the world come sit sit have a seat explain explain yourself how are you going to benefit me in what way will you add value to my life explain it to me then do something kuch karke dikhao show me and then maybe we'll think about an announcement it is completely counterintuitive to how god works but if god is truly god then he reserves the right to tell you what he's going to do to do it and then explain it and you do this especially when you're trying to rescue someone Well, you don't go to a drowning person and say listen what's going to happen now is we're going to throw you this rope it's a safe thing don't worry about it if you hold on to it i will pull you up and then you will come up and you'll be saved did you get that oh too late dead <laughs> you don't you don't do that when you're trying to rescue someone you make the announcement and this is this counterintuitive and you think about this in, in terms of football terms how do you stop a player like messi how do you stop a player like lionel messi you know what you do you isolate him you don't let him get the ball so you don't focus on stopping messi you focus on stopping the other players don't let them pass the ball to him do you know what this do you know why i'm what i'm trying to get at if god if we are to believe this we must have patience and if the enemy does not want us to believe it what is what will he do he will make us 
impatient. So that waiting is repulsive. We live in a 10-minute delivery city. We are being conditioned to be impatient. And God's promises require and call for patience. So if the enemy wants to undermine Jesus, he won't try to tell you none of this is true. He will try to tell you, why do you want to wait so long? Why do you want to wait so long? Waiting is a waste of time. Let's find some other, let's find some other solution. It's completely counterintuitive. But if you do receive it, what happens if you do receive it? If you do receive it, you will be filled with hope for what God will do. Because what it means is if the announcement is true, and look, we're on the better side of this announcement. Not only has this announcement been made, the action has been uh, completed, and we've received the explanation. All of it. We're on the better side of all of it. But if this is true, then one day every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day. Until that day, every other voice may say, you're an idiot, you're a fool, you're irrational, you're, so, you're, you're, you're bigoted, you're, you're, you're ugly, there's nothing I want to do with you. So the question is, what will you do until that day? What will you do until that day? But if you believe this, you will have hope that if one day he will be vindicated, then if I am in him, one day even I will be vindicated. Even I will be vindicated. You will have hope. You know, they say well, there's, a, there's a science of first impressions. You know, Amy Cuddy, she, she's, a, she's a Harvard uh, scholar and she wrote about something uh, has changed about first impressions. Earlier, when you had first impressions, you, know, you, would, you need a firm handshake and you need a confident, you need to project confidence. You know, the, and they, she says things have changed. You know, the, and actually in first impressions, there's two things people are thinking about when they meet you. The first thing they're trying to figure out is, what are your intentions? What do you want? And Delhi is a master of this, catchy. What do you want? What are you after? Why are you talking to me? What do you want? And the second question is, does this person have the capacity to act on their intentions? That's what we're... And if, if, you, if you sense oh, this person wants something from me and that you're capable of taking something from me, you know, withdraw. That's the science of first But in, if you have, if you meet Jesus this way, Two things become clear. His intention is to rescue you. His intention is to redeem you. And oh, he has the capacity to do it. And he has already done it. We're on the better end of this, so this whole story. So there's a song that really, in a way, only Jesus can sing, you know, and it's from Twilight. I don't know if you can call it a movie, but the song is good. Okay, here, and it's a very haunting song, and I love this song because it speaks to our longing for someone to love us like this. Okay, and this is, I have died every day waiting for you. Darling, don't be afraid. I have loved you for a thousand years. I have loved you for a thousand years. I will love you for a thousand more. And all along, I believed I would find you. And time has brought your heart to me. I have loved you for a thousand years. I love you for a thousand more. There is no rationality in this song. But it tells you everything our heart longs for. And it tells you there is someone who has the intent and the capacity to love us like that. You will never find a human being who will love you like this. No human being can do this for you. But there is one who has the intent and the capacity. So as Jeremiah announces, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And that's what this passage does. So his first impression is not great. But let, let me move on. <clears throat> if uh, uh, his great suffering, his first impression is not uh, what we want, but if we believe it, we will be loved. And his second, uh, the second thing is his, is his great suffering. So we move into the passage closer from both ends. Uh, 53 uh, verse 1 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, 
and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And then from the other end, verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. There's two things about this that we don't naturally want to believe want or accept. One is that he lives in rejection. He lives in rejection and he dies in innocence. He lives in rejection and he dies in innocence. Who has believed? To whom has the arm of the Lord been believed? He's like a young plant, a root out of dry ground. There's nothing impressive about it. There's nothing appealing about it. It has no visible attractiveness or fruitfulness. Now consider these words. Okay, marred crushed, put to grief, anguished, poured out, counted among the guilty, no form, no majesty, no beauty, despised, rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, one from whom people hide their faces, despised, not esteemed, oppressed, Afflicted, like a lamb led to the slaughter, like sheep before its shearers, silent, taken away, cut off, stricken, made his grave with the wicked, stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, pierced, crushed. Does this sound like the life you expect to associate with God? Does this sound like the life you expect to associate with God? Doesn't it sound more like your life? Doesn't it sound like more like our human experience? Because that is what God has done. For us to become like him, he became like us. He tasted the suffering that we know so familiar and it makes us feel so alone and so isolated. And he entered into that experience to say, no, you are not alone. I know this. I know this. This is not the experience we expect God to have. We don't naturally want, we want a God who doesn't, uh, is not led like a lamb to the slaughter. We want a God who leads people to the slaughter, who leads the wicked to the slaughter. We don't want a God who's silent. We want a God who's loud and aggressive and is going to destroy everything that rebels against him. He lives in rejection. The second thing, he dies in innocence. See, not all, but at least some of our suffering is self-inflicted. But the suffering of the servant is completely undeserving. It's completely undeserving. He is totally innocent and yet completely submissive. In oppression and affliction, he does not protest. Like a lamb, like a sheep. We want lions and, and grizzly bears. He has done no violence. There is no deceit in his mouth. Why is he submitting uh, to such injustice? We want a God who reigns victoriously and destroys the wicked. We receive a God who, is, uh, who suffers unimaginably to rescue the wicked. Now, if we, if we, if we do receive it, what, what, what happens if we do receive it? If we do receive this, even though it's so counterintuitive, then what we, ha what we have is we have great companionship in our suffering. We have great fellowship in our rejection. We enjoy someone, the company of someone who knows exactly what we are going through and who is with us all the time. He's not a stranger to, uh, to this. You know, the, the Superman uh, comic book went through, has been through an evolution. When Superman first started out, he could do like, things that other people could not do. He could run pretty fast 
uh, faster than a train. He could lift heavy things, and he could he could do all kinds of things. But then gr gradually he started to gain more powers. You know, suddenly he's moving planets, and he's flying at the speed of light. And he's like, he's like uh, lasers are coming out of his eyes, and he's freezing things with his breath. All kinds of things he can do. And at some point, Superman became so strong, he became unrelatable. Became like this is just too foreign. So they introduced, so as they, they didn't just increase his powers, they began to increase his vulnerability. They introduced kryptonite. Kryptonite can weaken him. There's all different kinds of kryptonite. And it can, he can become weak. And then he became more relatable. Jesus is not Superman. He is not so powerful that we can't relate to him. This is a God so great. What are we to do with him? He becomes like us so that we can become like him. I can't relate to a God who is high and mighty and so mighty and so powerful because I am not strong and mighty and powerful. You know what I am? I am weak. I am despised. I am rejected. That I know. That I know. You show me a God who knows that, that I can relate to. He became like us so we can become like him. We can, in suffering, no fellowship can be sweeter than your fellowship with a fellow sufferer. And when you are fellowshipping with Jesus, you are fellowshipping with someone who knows what it's like to be despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. His great suffering. That's the second thing. If we, it's counterintuitive, but if we receive it, we have great comfort. But finally, his audacious proposal. His audacious proposal. Right at the heart of this passage, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> So like, like two arrows from either side pointing, they're, they're, the passage works to the center to point to this, from verse 4 to 6. Uh, surely, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If he is so innocent, then who is guilty? If he is so innocent, who is guilty? Do you see how Isaiah speaks of us as if we were there? As if we were there. Do you know why he does that? He does that because in a manner of speaking, we were. So Rembrandt, when he painted a painting called Raising of the Cross, it's a picture of the uh, people who are putting Jesus on the cross and raising him to be crucified. He painted himself into the painting. So Rembrandt is in the painting because he's trying to say, I was there, and so are you. We did this to him. We are part of this. So to, to, to truly appreciate the cross, we have to share in the responsibility of those who put him there. To truly appreciate the cross, we have to share in the responsibility of those who put him there. And this is what we don't want to accept. We, like sheep, we have gone astray. Sheep. We don't want to be sheep. No NBA team is described as sheep. You have the Minnesota Timberwolves, Memphis Grizzlies, Toronto Raptors, Chennai Super Kings. The kings is not enough. Super kings. That's what we want. Can you imagine New Delhi sheep? <laughs> Who wants to be sheep? Who wants? No, nobody wants to be sheep. We want to be lions. We don't want to be sheep. <clears throat> There's a a uh, preacher who was once criticized for making too much out of sin. He said, you're, you're just talking too much about sin, too much about guilt. You need to tone it down. Like, say mistakes. Failures, weaknesses, stuff like that. So it's too much, too much sin talk. If you if you keep talking about sin, people become sinners. They'll do the more sin. So you know, don't don't talk about sin too much. And he told, he he pointed at a bottle in his office. I don't know why he had this bottle in his office. It was a bottle of strychnine. Strychnine, strychnine. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Strychnine. It's a pesticide of some sort. It's a poison. 
And he said, you know what you're doing? You're asking me to take the label off the... Uh, there's a label on it that says poison. And you're saying, take the label off and put essence of peppermint on, on the bottle. Just label it differently. And he said, you know, the softer you make the label, the more dangerous the poison becomes. The softer you make the label, the more dangerous the poison becomes. You have to call sin what it is, and you have to name the human condition what it is. We are guilty. Guilt is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. We are under the legal accusation of guilt. Whether you feel guilty or not is irrelevant. We stand guilty. What, what is our guilt? Like sheep, we turned away. We turned away. See, all sin begins with substitution. All sin begins with substitution. It's not the offenses we commit. It's not the offenses. We're, we're a middle class community. Look around you. Do you see any real sinners here? Seriously. We're well educated middle class, university educated, we do good things actually. Some of you are social workers. We do good things. Maybe you've done like one shameful thing you don't want to tell anybody about, but you know, Jesus, that's what Jesus died for, and you know, that it's covered. But not seriously, we haven't done any serious offenses. But sin is not about the offenses we have committed. It is whom we have offended. That's where the gravity of sin comes. It doesn't matter what we have turned to. It's that we have turned away. That's the sin. We, it doesn't matter. You may have turned as a Pharisee to your good works, or you may have turned as a prostitute to your prostitution. The Pharisee and the prostitute are equally guilty because both turned away. And they said to God, what I want, you're not going to give me. I'm going to find something else. I'm going to find something else. I'm going to turn away. All sin begins with substitution. We replace God with something else, and it matters not what you replace him with. It's that we replaced him. All sin begins with substitution. That's why salvation is also by substitution. And salvation is also by substitution. This is his audacious proposal. If you cover your sin, I will expose it. If you cover your sin, I will expose it. But if you expose your sin, I will cover it. If you, ex if, you ex if you cover your sin, I will expose it. But if you expose your sin, I will cover it. In salvation, God says to us, uh, not you. I will turn to someone else for satisfying my wrath. I will turn to someone else to satisfy my judgment. See, in the language of this passage, Jesus is uh, the priest. He sprinkles the nations. That's the language of priesthood. There's the lamb and the sheep. He is the sacrifice. That's the symbol of sacrifice. <clears throat> and he is the temple. Jesus is the priest, the temple, and the sacrifice for our sin, for our iniquities, and our transgression. That's why a church can meet in a basement in a hotel. We don't need the priest. We don't need the temple. We don't need the animals. It's all been done. It's all been finished. His work is done. And then in, in this passage, what we are being told, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He becomes the sacrifice for everything that we are guilty of, and through him we become innocent. Through him we become innocent, we become clean. There's this uh, book uh, in the late 90s that came out called The Iron Giant. They made a movie out of it also. And uh, some of the, the book has been described this way. It's one of the greatest of modern fairy tales. The Iron Giant is a story so gripping that when you begin to read it out loud, everyone stops to listen, young children and old people alike. And once you know it, you never forget it. A classic is something utterly strange and original and yet as deeply familiar and, and necessary as your own hands. The Iron Giant is like no other story in the world. And 30 years after its publication, we need it as much as ever. Without giving away too many spoilers, the heart of the Iron Giant, somebody dies so somebody else can live. Somebody dies so somebody else can live. But you know what is missing in all these stories? Why these stories are unforgettable? 
because the person who dies usually dies for the good people, for the ones who deserve it. And you're happy because you identify with those good people. Well, you know why the Iron Giant and all these stories are nothing like the Gospel? Because in the Gospel it says, for God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't die for his friends, he died for his enemies. That's how he made them his friends. That is the miracle. He dies for those who turned against him. And that's how he turns them to him. God justifies the ungodly and we have to accept that we are the ungodly that he justified. And if we do receive it, then you have this surely, surely, without a doubt, with utmost confidence, our guilt is covered and we are free and we will enjoy real unity with God, real peace. And you see some of the, the results of the, the language of this. He will see and be satisfied. And it calls up this imagery of a, of a woman in labor. Right? It's, like, it's something like that, where she's, she's, she's waiting and expecting. And after all of the pain, after all of the suffering, she sees the baby. She sees the baby and she's satisfied. And that's the satisfaction, that's the joy for which Jesus endures. And one day he will see a group of people gathered in a, in a basement in a hotel. And he will be satisfied. That all his labor has, has borne fruit. Let me close with this. There's a story <coughs> of a, a French, uh, French, Frenchman who grew up in a loving family. Uh, and uh, he was a computer scientist in finance. Uh, six feet tall, uh, play, played volleyball uh, at the national level, and on weekends he would go out for matches. He's very happy with his life. He goes to the Caribbean islands and he meets a girl there. And, uh, and he, you know, being French, maybe, I don't know, he wants to sleep with her. And she says, no, I'm a, I believe in uh, God and uh, that sex belongs in marriage. This, he's astonished, like, how can anyone think like this in this day and age? And he... This, I have to prove this entire thing wrong. And he, uh, he goes, so he decides, and he thinks to himself, what good reason was there to think God exists? Uh, and he says, but if I was going to refute Christianity, I first needed to know what it claimed. So I picked up a Bible, and he said, and he said I also prayed, if there is a God, then here I am. Why don't you go ahead and reveal yourself to me? I'm open. And uh, it's a dangerous prayer. But he, he prayed it. Uh, and, and, and soon after that, he had a shoulder injury, for which there's no explanation. And he can't go for matches on weekends. So his weekends have opened up suddenly. What do I do? Sunday, what do I do? Maybe I'll go to church. And he goes to a church. And he starts, uh, he meets the pastor. He starts having, he builds up a relationship with the pastor and bombards him with questions. They have long conversations over a long period of time. And, uh, and then I, I, he, he's, 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 he's thinking to himself and his, his prayer shifted to God. If you are real, you need to make it clear so that I can jump in and not make a fool of myself. And he prays this uh, prayer, and then suddenly, and, and you would think that some great explanation would come, right? because that's how God works, explanation. Uh, you know what happens? He suddenly has this, uh, uh, he, he's struck with an intense guilt. With an intense guilt. Because he remembers one instance in his life where he did something so sinister, and he covered it up with so many lies. And he's just filled with this intense guilt and disgusted at himself and just can't, move around. And then he, in that moment he realized, this is why Jesus had to die. Because of me. Because of me. And all that guilt is reversed. Because now he knows he doesn't have to hide it. It's been covered. It's been covered. Someone has taken the place for him. And he says, uh, uh, he says so that in God's justice my sins would be forgiven by grace as a gift rather than my, by my righteous deeds or religious rituals. He died so that I may live. I placed my trust in Jesus and asked him to forgive me. And this, in short, is how God takes a French atheist and makes a Christian theologian out of him. Through the journey of recognizing guilt and seeing your substitute. And if you, you know, the thing about the gospel is that uh, it's not a courtroom. I mean, this is not a courtroom drama. 
in a courtroom, we, we don't just go from guilt to innocence. There's a reason we go from guilt to innocence. The reason we go from guilt to innocence is not so that we can just be innocent people, but so that we can be His people. We belong to Him. We can call Him Father. Just like Jesus calls Him Father. There is a union that we are brought into. We become sons and daughters of God. Not just acquitted people. This is a family room. He doesn't stop at the courtroom. He turns it into a family room. Where all these people will be my people. And when you have that, when you have that, then you have a reason to worship. Because the announcement has been made uh, that he, I will redeem you. The action has been done to redeem you. But the explanation, the explanation will always and only be a mystery. It will always be, how can someone like you call someone like me to belong to you? The explanation will always be a mystery. And that's where wonder comes from. That's why we'll always have a reason to worship because there is no explanation for this. There's no rational reason. He is loving and He is merciful and that's why we worship. When you walk in that, you will always walk in freedom. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for uh, your word. You are the first uh, to have spoken and broken this cold silence between us. Lord. And you have revealed yourself not just in spoken word, but in the living word. You've sent us your son. He has come near to us. He has felt what we feel. He has endured what we endure. He's familiar with what we know. He also knows our guilt. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, though we are enemies, you have treated us as friends. And though we are not like you, you have made us like you. We have done nothing to deserve your mercy, nothing to deserve your love. We have brought nothing to you but our rebellion. And you have shown us nothing but your mercy. It is so counterintuitive, nobody wants to believe it. So we thank you, Lord, that even our desire to believe it is a gift from you. And we thank you, Lord, we thank you for this gift of grace that binds us to you as your people, your children eternally belonging to you. And Lord, in this world we just ask that you would make us a people who live out of a sense of such wonder and such joy and such love that it would be contagious, that wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to contain ourselves and won't be able to constrain our desire to bring and fold other people into this love. Make us a loving people, make us like you, make us merciful and kind and generous and giving, just as you have been to us, and help us freely give what we have freely received. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.